couple things from last time, some exciting things that have happened uh, where I filed up these dividers. I know you guys probably really wanted me to spend this two hours filing these dividers so you could see how that works. <laughs> but I decided to go ahead and file them up. So these are the dividers I forged the other day. Um, <laughs> do you want me to put it on the anvil? Here we go. So these are the dividers that I forged the other day, yesterday, two days ago in the demo. Um, all filed up. There's a I, I think I'll tighten the rivet just a little bit more. It's a little bit loose. Um, but a couple things about this. When I get to the point in filing, sorry, what? Oh, um, when I get to the point in filing where I want to be careful about the surfaces that I'm making, because if you grab it in the file, it's going to get all buggered up by those jaws. I either use uh, pieces of leather to hold it. You know, I can just put that around these sides once they get draw filed and then hold it in the vise. Um, and that'll protect that. Um, and then also a nice little thing that I use is I made up this little um, braised together, forged, whatever else, uh, jig to go in the vise so that this goes around the outside of the dividers. Um, and then what this allows is it allows me to clamp them in the vise um, and not, um, not clamp the head. Because right, if I just clamped the head in there, they'd be flopping all over the place. So I essentially made myself a couple mini vise jaws to hold that really nice and tight and be able to do the filing on the legs. Um, so I just wanted to show you that about the filing. I'll go ahead and pass these around if you guys want. Those will be in the silent auction. Yes, sir. Um, the legs appear to have a different patina. Uh, um, so the other thing I did, thanks for asking, is I um, also hardened the tips. Like I, I mentioned that the other day, I think. But so I, I hardened the tips by just heating them up to dull glowing and quenching them in water. And as I heated them up, I decided for this pair that I would go ahead and heat patina the whole set, the whole, all the legs. So I just heated them all up to black and brushed them and then right at the end, heated the tips and quenched them. So it was just for fun, just for oh, a heat patina. And then did you have to clean up the files? Just, oh, just the head. Uh, well, the whole, they were totally done. So I just went in with some sandpaper and cleaned up any, yeah, a little, heap, a little bit of heat patina that got up onto, I mean, it's all kind of muddy, you'll see. I'll, yeah. I'll probably go in when I'm actually done tightening it up and um, really do nice. that thing. Thanks, yeah, I think. I like that color contrast. Um, that's that. OK. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's all I have to say about that. So let's move on to a different tool. I thought I'd talk about um, a jeweler saw that I make. Um, these are a pretty fun project to pursue. They have a lot of interesting little forgings in them. Well, I didn't think I would cover them all this, this weekend, so I just wanted to pick two that I thought were um, exciting. And this is actually what I, I think this is one of the most interesting forgings that I, that I do, like in my production work, um, because it's a really great uh, example of, um, of, of this material that we work in, of, of steel and of its properties and how to forge um, and what that material can do. So this is essentially each one of these, if you divide these sections into three, so there's this mortise that has a hole punch through it. There's a central section, and then there's this end that has a little pad and the tang drawn out. These are each the, uh, pretty much the same amount of material, and they're turned into three totally different things out of the same stock. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and forge that out for you now. Um, this is just mild steel, and we're going to start uh, with some. Here, I'll go ahead and pass these around as well. So this is the finished. This is the finished jeweler saw. Um, that's been in use for a while. Um, and then this is uh, just kind of a sample that is partially filed. It's not finished filed, but. Um.
half inch square mild steel. I'm forging this out of half inch square mild steel. Yes? Uh, the question is, is have I ever worked in wrought iron? Um, yes, I love working in wrought iron. Um, it, and the coffer that I showed a video of is uh, almost com all wrought iron. Um, yeah, it's a really enjoyable material to work in. Uh, if you don't know about it, it has, um, it was the main material before the Bessemer process and steel was invented. And it has a grain structure much like wood, so it's got some properties that are, um, that make it a little bit different to work than steel. Um, it works at a very high heat, really lovely, like it's very fluid, it forge welds really well, and it's also a joy to file um, because it's softer. What, you don't think that would be part of my decision-making process? <laughs> See ya, I'm gonna go. Ah, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, sourcing my wrought iron, I don't have a large source. I'm bad about looking for it and trying to get it. Um, I have a bit, but it's mostly been um, either bought from other people or gifted from people. Um, I found actually very little on my own. Um, so I was just talking to a gentleman about, I guess he's, he's up in the Northeast and he's like, are you interested in rot? He's like, oh, I get it all the time and you know, it's more than I need. So I was like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm interested, <laughs> please. So yeah, it's not, it's not made anymore. So it's a tough material to come by. So we're gonna start by um, hanging about a half inch, uh, not a half inch, a little over an inch off the edge of the anvil and necking it down. Noticing that I'm turning it every time all the way around because I'm almost surely gonna make a miss hit and knock it off center. And so that just kind of helps keep things in line. Okay, so that's a bit more than an inch. Um, and then the next step I'm gonna take is gonna, I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna use that taper that I just made, which I tapered to, I tapered down to a little over a quarter of an inch. This is, as I talked about, I'm training my eyes. I'm always trying to look at the material and estimate. And so I'm going to about a quarter inch um, and now I'm gonna go and, and do full face blows to isolate that center. Um, and I'm gonna start that at the top of the taper, if that makes sense. The taper goes up where it ends, that's where I'm gonna start that next isolation. This has a little bit of a rag on it and as I hold it in my hand, I don't particularly want to slice it up. Uh, so another thing that I brought out to show you all was um, this set right here. So uh, in my slides that show last night, I talked about Nunome Zogon, that Japanese style of damascene. So I have four examples of that here. Um, uh, some samples, including the one that I did in Japan with Kashima-san, and um, the tools that are needed to execute it. So you can take, you can take a look at those maybe during the break. Uh, maybe we can show the camera at some point, unless you can see it. Oh yeah, okay. Let me just make sure this doesn't burn, that's fine. Yeah, so for the camera, you can see those are some of the samples. Oops, sorry, I don't know where I'm looking. Does that help? Change cameras, change cameras? Oh, me change cameras, I thought you guys were, oh no. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm not moving. <laughs> okay. <laughs> here they are, here they aren't. All right. So that taper. So same thing, tapering down to about the same amount, and then you have to kind of get in here with a smaller hammer and draw this out. Okay, that's going to be close enough um, for right now because that's that middle is still going to get squished around and I also don't want it to get too long right now. So now I'm going to upset the end. I'll be doing that in the vise. Do you need to know right now? Don't you want a little bit of mystery in this demonstration? Was that no? I'm not going to tell you. You'll have to stick around. <laughs> well, which end would you start with? How about that? I don't know where it went, but looking at it, which end would be easier to make first and then hold on to? Or make first and not put back in the fire? Any thoughts? The tapered end? Wrong answer. <laughs> so, no, so you could do it that way. No, the first, the first side is going to be the boss, where the, where the arm of the jeweler saw comes through. Because I'm going to punch that. It'll be a little bit easier to hold on to that with flat songs and then do and do the rest of the forging um, and also I'm gonna punch that and want a really clean hole that I'm not gonna want to heat up again um, so where I get too carried away here I'm gonna turn it in the vise so I get even shoulders Um, so that's starting to upset that. On my vise at home, I have just uh, rounded one little section of the jaws a tiny bit because I make a lot of these, and it allows a nice, smooth transition up to that bolster. Um, these are much sharper jaws, so we're going to give a much sharper shoulder. So that's just one difference that I'm looking at. Try and make sure it's going down equal in both directions. And always kind of a two. 
Coming back here to the other side. Throw up those shoulders. Okay, so that's coming along there. Um, I, in my shop, I have my vise. Um, I'm set up at the forge like this, and my vise is right here. So it's nice for doing hot work because it's literally just a step away and right back in, and the anvil's right here. And so you can be real efficient about the amount that you get done in that heat. And especially for this operation, it's in and out of the vise a few times. So. So I'm going to go ahead and take a measurement here. Uh, I'm looking to be about, uh, what am I looking to be? Right, 7 sixteenths thick. Um, so that's half inch, so I could still go a sixteenth thinner there. And this is looking to be between an inch and 7 eighths of an inch. So I'm, I'm right there on that. I could. I can tell I could just use a little bit more length this way in the boss, so I'll aim for that while trying to keep uh, the high dimension. Um, and I'm also looking at it and can see that I'm skewed this way a little bit, uh, so I'll just also keep that in mind as I make these corrections and try and center everything up. And bring the center back a little bit here. Probably the most important part right here. Oh, sorry, my mic. Um, probably the most important, one of the most important parts is making sure that this is nice and even and parallel because I'm going to be punching through it, and if I'm skewed off at all, then it's just going to, everything's going to go out of whack. Okay? My, I don't know, a simple tool of steel that isn't heat treated. I don't know who asked that. Um, but yeah, the punch is made out of probably 4140 that isn't heat treated, likely. Uh, 
Um, this punch is pretty, pretty small. Um, so even more so than the chasing hammer, um, this needs to be in and out real, really quick, really fast. So I'm gonna work really quickly and hopefully it will work. I'm not going to get greedy here with my first heat. I'm going to spend a minute making sure that everything's centered up. Okay, now I have a good established um, mark, hole even, uh, that I'll be punching through so that I can take a good heat and get in and out of there quickly. And I found that with punching small holes like this through this much material, especially through this much material, the hard way and everything, it, the best thing to do is, is be confident and get a really good hammer blow in and drive it as far as you can and get it back out as quickly as you can. Yeah. Any use a, do I ever use a lube on the small stuff? No, I've ne I don't use, I haven't, nope. No, when I'm punching hammer heads, larger hammer heads, um, I, well not, when I'm doing production run of, not the chasing hammers, but other hammer heads, larger ones, then I use, I use ground up coal as a release as I'm punching through. Um, but no, I haven't, I haven't actually ever tried using it, so. the punch is already hot so it's like you really got to get in and out of there Ooh. I'm going off center here that's not good I haven't been that off in a while that will what oh Yeah, I'm pretty far off, so I wouldn't, I would normally go a bit further, but I'm going to try and correct by going through this side. Ooh. And it smells nice too. So I can feel that it went free. But of course, because I was off a little bit, it's hung up on the side there. Yeah, that's a bugger. Um, okay. Well, I'm going to give it one more heat. So I'll just be honest and say that I am being honest that most of the time I do this in, you know, one or two heats and can get through and flip it over and get that little slug out of there just like the chasing hammer. But you guys are really stressing me out. So <laughs> I screwed up. It's on you. <laughs> 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 
I could do a little filing, yeah. <laughs> so I'll just try and get this slug kind of cleared out of there if I can. Um, yeah. How am I? Uh, how am I supporting my material? And yeah, it's just kind of against, yeah. It's against my leg like this, and I'm going in like that. Yeah. Um, Stuart's asking if there's down pressure from my punch hand. Yeah, as I'm, as I'm, well, let me, I'll, I'll answer that as this cools or as I get it at the end of this heat. Yeah, so I'm just kind of holding it with my leg. There it is. Um, yeah, so I'm kind of holding it with my leg. And then when I go to line up to punch, I'm, I'm holding the punch like this, looking side to side. Uh, I'm a blacksmith, so I don't like putting handles on my tools. <laughs> so I just like lifting up and burning my hand. And then, um, <laughs> so yeah, so then I just lift up. Um, and yeah, I'm putting downward pressure as I get up there. And yeah, I'm definitely holding it down um, as I drive it through. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so we have a hole in there. It ain't beautiful, but it will work. Um, we want a corresponding drift, like I spoke about the other day. Uh, and so this is going to go in here and um, fill up and pretty much touch on all the sides. And it's going to be the same thing with this, is that this drift is going to get driven through quickly um, so that uh, I can drive it through and get it out before it's too hot. Uh, I do make these out of, I actually know the material I make these out of, because it seems to work well as I make these drifts out of O1, um, and they hold up pretty well um, for things that are going to go through, and then you need to hammer on the side of a little bit. And that's uh, just normalized? Yeah, it's not heat, it's not heat treated, yeah. Seems pretty cool. Before I go melting the table. Thank you. Maybe I should put one on. Um, this is another tool that I'll be using for this. Is it's just a piece of, I guess it's three quarter. Yeah, three quarter inch square that's folded in half, and that'll create a nice little bolster for that drift to go through. So one confident hit straight down, because that drift is hot. And if I tap, tap, it's probably going to bend. It's probably going to get stuck. So um, yeah, I've really, I feel like, a, I don't know, for me, I feel like a lot of forging becomes about confidence, or confidence becomes a part of, of good, efficient forging. Um, because if you can, if you're not um, hesitant about the hammer blows you're making, um, then things seem to move more quickly and smoother, and um, I feel like that's a good example. Sorry, as I look around for things. So now I'm going for the opposite side. In and out. Oh. <laughs> yeah, me neither. 
This demo might be over. Oh. Damn. I told you, you guys are stressing me out. Thank you for appreciating that, because <laughs> that was probably the best thing I'll do all day. <laughs> yeah, right? My big old speech, me and my big mouth. All right, this demo is going well. <laughs> No, I take it in and out. I go equidistant from both sides. Yeah, I'll drive it all the way through. Yep. Yes, the drift will ultimately pass all the way through. Yeah, that was totally a bad move. I shouldn't have put it in after that. It probably didn't help. It also really didn't help that the drift was as warm as it was when I put it in there and that it was the second time I should have I should have put it back in the fire or cooled off the tool. Um, yeah. It's 01, so yeah. No. <laughs> so no, I I don't think I would. No. Of course not. That would be that would be a terrible idea. It, yeah, no, that would be a great idea. Um, I don't. I usually just don't screw up this bad. <laughs> yeah. But sure, it would be, it'd be totally smart to have more than two, I mean more than one, so that you could let one cool down, pick one up. Now that it cooled down from glowing, I feel fine about cooling that in water. Yay, Yay. we're not done yet. Um, so I wanna put that through at a, at a lower heat. Um, And as you can see, as it cools, it's getting tighter. So I can let it cool down even a bit more, and I'll pass it through again. And what's happening is that's just like your forging heat versus your refining heat, is that you're forging at a hot temperature, and um, then as the metal cools, um, I can drive this drift through, and it's going to create a really, really clean, smooth interior. And I find that to be key for these, because there's no way I can, I can't believe I'm saying this, there's no way I can file that as good. <laughs> um, just getting that drift to go through and leave a, and what I'm gonna, well I need to be not talking and throw this through one more time. Um, and uh, if you could look at the inside of this, which it's just not really possible unless we pass this all around right now, but the interior is actually reflecting light. It's burnished, it has a really smooth interior and that's gonna be as good as I can get it, it's, yeah. So that's why I try and be done with that and not go back in the fire with that. Um, so now I'm gonna cut off the other end, cut it off on the other end and forge out the other side, okay? I think it's um, really, I think it is helpful. <laughs> you guys just saw me screw up, so who's to believe me? But I think it's really helpful to um, actually have sanding marks or however you're gonna finish your drift 
usually I do, I use like a belt sander on the drift and make sure the sanding marks are going with the direction of the movement of the drift so that it's not binding. It doesn't, I don't know if that actually helps, but um, I don't think it hurts. Man, we're about to have a jeweler saw with a really short arm there. A non-adjustable jeweler saw with a fixed arm. <laughs> So I'll go to the hardy and cut off. It's getting a bit warm. Cut off about an inch, maybe a hair more. And um, at the hardy, I'm actually pulling towards it so that the majority of the rag on that cutoff is on this piece, not the piece that I need to dress and upset. I was using the other day went. Would it have been over there? Is anything with a red handle in this shop hot? The hot rasp, the hot tool? Does it matter? Does anyone know? Okay. Thank you. I got one. Thank you. So this is, pretty, this is pretty much the same process, um, but at this step I just go ahead, and I would have if I had more heat, is flatten it right back down to the parent stock of that in-between piece. So flatten it right back to like quarter inch before I do the rest of the upsetting.
this is where we are so far. Thanks. I obviously wasn't working hard enough the other day because this didn't fall off nearly as many times. So ultimately the form I'm aiming for here is nothing super specific, but it is about, um, it is about a quarter, a uh, half inch wide this way, about a quarter inch wide here, and then skewed slightly. Um, so there's a little bit more material on one side. take one more heat and clean this up just a little bit more nicely. Um, thin it out a little bit this way uh, so that I get a little bit more length out of each side. But we're pretty, pretty much there. Okay, so that's my target right there. We'll get it up against this. My length, this one actually turned out a little long. So uh, if this was closer to the right length, I would make sure I wouldn't stretch that anymore. It's actually a hair long. I could upset that if I really needed to. Um, just in terms of trying to standardize these for each saw. Um, and because the only real important measurement here is between the inside of the boss and the inside of the arm. That kind of dictates how I sell these. And the first thing I'm going to do is that pad. So I'll do that out of the shorter side.
we have to think about this one. That gets that pad set in there. Um, I often do this with a little step block, or it's just a piece of it's just a piece of case hardened steel that's the thickness um, of the depth that I want, and I put it on the power hammer dies and flip that upside down and line it up and just go pop, and that gives me a really clean, nice clean step. But this is a way to do it at the anvil. I'll take this out just a little bit further. Quiet afternoon. Stop sleeping. There's that step. So that step is in there. So let's flip it around and draw out the tang. Seth, can you talk to the, uh, the shoulder? Does that line up with the arm that goes across? This shoulder lines up with the arm? Yeah, it should be in the center so that it comes back. Now I can adjust that cold in the end after it cools down if things are off a little bit. Um, uh, but yeah, ultimately you want the inside of this to be in line with the center of this so that when this comes up and has a matching pad at the top, which is also in the center, everything's in line. But I try and leave enough mass um, in that, in the cross piece so that I can shift things back and forth cold if they need to be and still have room to file a little bit, yeah. Because I, I'm trying to pick my battles here. You know, there's a lot. Um, there's a lot I can do forging wise, and I could, like, I know I could, I know I could get the forgings closer to being super finished. But I also want to leave a little bit of oversize or a little bit of slop so that I can adjust things cold. Because ultimately, it's just easier to adjust things cold. So I'm going to do this on the hammer here. I'm going to try and do this on the hammer here. Um, I could. There's just like no. There's no great way to do it at the anvil. I've found it's such a small little piece of metal. And you'll see what I'm going to do here is you can see that this tang is on the diamond, um, and so I'm going to be turning it and forging it square first on the diamond and then drawing out a tang. And so I could, I could figure, I could find a place to do that on the anvil. The most obvious place is right here so that you can swing this up and down. Um, but to get those shoulders nice and clean and uptight there, um, I mean, I guess my hammer control is just not there. So it's a lot easier to do that on the hammer that's going to hit really evenly.
Oh, you get the idea. <laughs> so that's how I go about it, doing it. That's a bit rough, but you can see I, go, I went square first, tried to just get that square, and then started to draw out the tang. I'll draw the rest of this out by, ha by hand now that it's here and make it a little bit smoother. Go ahead and straighten this a little bit. So I definitely try and get an ap approximate straightness before I'm done. Um, but I think I'll just go ahead and end it there. It was cursed from the start. <laughs> you, get the, you get the basic form of all this. And this isn't, I mean, this really isn't far off from how I would, how I would leave it in terms of um, cleaning it up. Um, because it is, it's a small piece. It doesn't take too much work to file. And that gives me the room to shift things around. And so the first thing I do when I finish this is I will, um, all I will do is I will file the back end of this. Uh, I'll probably file the top and the bottom, and maybe these, and I'll drill and tap that hole, and then I will, before I do anything else, that's a lie, I don't file these, I don't file these. I drill and tap that hole pretty much first thing, and then I have a straight piece of false arm that I can stick in there and tighten, and that's going to tell me, because I can't totally tell like how this is sitting in here, so that gives me an indicator of if this is like this or like this, and then I can cold hit this so that it adjusts it so that it's in line with everything, and then I can file things to be in line with that, as opposed to filing this how it looks and then putting that in there and seeing it's like that and needing to hit it and then have to file more material away. So that's the first thing I do, and then I'll proceed with the rest of the file work. Okay, any questions, comments, concerns? Feedback? I know Jennifer has some feedback. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I was also going to forge a thumb screw for these because um, I think it's a neat little forging. We'll do that out of 3 8 square mild steel. Uh, when you're thinking about making hardware, you want to think. You want to, you need to figure out what size hardware you're making. If you're making quarter 20 hardware, then you're going to need to forge a 10 in first. And you're going to need that to be a quarter inch or slightly above um, so that you can remove scale or anything and then cut threads on it to make that quarter 20. Um, this is a 1024 screw that I use in these. So a, a bit smaller than quarter inch. 
Um, and so I have a corresponding hole to fit that, and I don't have the size of it off the top of my head, but smaller than quarter inch. Would someone grab me a top tool, um, like the, the most broad fuller there is? Yeah, that bread loaf, please. So we're going to draw a tenon out here. I'm going to recenter it kind of part way through. Thank you. And if I have the hole that I'm going to try to fit this to, then uh, I can have it right here, and you need to draw something out square, right? So to kind of give yourself a little bit of a guesstimation of when this will start to fit in there round, I will forge it until it's just slightly smaller than the hole, because as we talked about at some point, when something goes round, it gets a little bit bigger. Maybe we didn't talk about that, but we talked about the mass difference. So if you have quarter inch square and you turn it to, well, that's it. It's the, if you have quarter inch square and then you make it round, it's going to be larger than quarter inch round. It's going to be, someone said 20% larger, I believe. Um, and so th I know that when this goes round, it'll get a little bit larger in diameter and then be close to fi fitting in that hole. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, that could work. This is cute. I like your bread loaf and all that. Now I'll go around. So I went quite fit. Okay, there we go. So that it fits in there. Um, now I'm going to go and cut off um, a square's worth, so three-eighths of an inch up, because this is three-eighths stock. So I'll cut off visually what is about a, a cube of this material. For these ones, yeah, that's about how the forging works out. Again, it's a trial and error thing. You know, I forged a bunch of these and then figured out I didn't have enough material or not a, or too much material. Um, Now, so that I have the most heat possible, I'm actually going to leave it on the bar, tip it up, and I'll put it in the fire just like this so that it heats that head really well, keeps the, the shank cold, and then I can come out and break it off and upset it with a good amount of heat in it, into it. This is another one of those forgings that's 
really fun to do in um, you know in the least amount of heat possible and the most efficient way possible. So like if I'm really cruising on these, then I would try and forge the tenon and get it cut to this point in that first heat. The second heat, we'll heat that up, break it off, and upset it. Flatten it on the diamond. Okay, and give myself that sort of shape. So I'm going to take one more heat to clean this up a little bit more, flatten it a bit, um, and dress it once. And the reason I'm doing this shape um, is because the last step is to take fullers in and create these nice hollows on either side of it, um, right? So that swoops in, swoops in, um, and that's going to stretch the material super aggressively out. So I'm going to make it super short with the anticipation that it's going to stretch back out. I don't know if you noticed before when I was hammering, but if there's mass on one side to the other, then I'll put the larger mass away from me and I'll try and hammer it back this way to recenter the mass. So at this point, the mass should be pretty well centered on that shank. And would someone like to strike for me? Anybody, anybody, any takers? Thanks. Uh, on the other side of the horn, and we'll do this over the horn. Um, I will, let's do this first, then I'll describe it. Oh, sorry, you can stand here. Over this side of the yep. Heart. <laughs> How much do you want? A hard hit. Do another heat. Let me show you before we do another heat, I guess. Making small parts like this can be super fussy. I usually, uh, in terms of fire maintenance, I usually am I'm really trying to keep a packed fire in there so that it's a nice solid bed to be able to put a piece in on and not have it slip down to the netherworld. I use coal for just about everything. Okay, I think that's fine. You can see what happens there um, and the concept behind that. Um, 
So for my tooling at home, what I what I have is I do this on the power hammer, and I'm actually I'm uh, I I'm pretty psyched about this little piece of tooling that I came up with in terms of making us uh, I don't maybe exists already I hadn't seen it before, but for making a spring swage that has built-in stop lock on it is I took a piece of round tool steel, 4140, I think, and turned it in the lathe so that it had a shoulder down, and then cut it in half and flip those around, and then those two shoulders connecting act as a stop block. Um, so I can put this in here and bring it right down, and it'll be the same thickness every time. And with the power hammer, this is like a two-hit operation. And I think I'll, like this, you can probably see the difference between, it's pretty close between this and the ones that I brought, but it creates a really clean, um, a really clean quick movement of the material um, to make a good forging. Um, yeah, so from here I would go ahead and um, do a little, cut it to length, do a little bit of, uh, fi do the file work around the, the head of it to make it smooth and then do just do a little file work to get if there's any scale on it or something like that, and then cut the threads with a die, um, with a hand, hand die. Is that little brass thing just threaded, or is it just driven on? It's just driven on, so I, cut, I make that. Well, actually, I drill it to the right size, but leave the rag on the drill when, it, when I part it on the lathe, and then when I drive it on, that rag kind of binds it up on there. Yeah, so I also turn all the parts on the saw including, so these little washers and um, the ferrule. All right. We have 15 minutes. Um, because I think it's easier for, for, I think it's plenty of thread. The question was why do I use a coarse thread versus a fine thread? Um, I want the fine, the strongest thread I can, so I think in my mind, a little bit coarser thread is going to be good for that. There's plenty of thickness for that coarse thread to go through and uh, grab on. I'm not worried about it stripping out. And then um, in terms of action, a coarser thread is going to open more quickly than a finer thread for you to change your saw blade out. Um, did you have a question, Scott? Yeah. Do you have two shapers? I have one shape. I have two shapers. Only one is hooked up. The other one should probably go away. <laughs> one one should go away, yeah. Um, but is that saw around? Is it on the table? No. Thank you. Um, so just to go over a couple other aspects of this, um, the other parts of this are there's these little pads. These, well, let me take a step back. The thumb screws are made out of mild steel. This is made out of mild steel. Um, I case harden the thumb screws. Um, I case harden the pad end of this forging that we did. This is made out of 1045, which is heat treated. Um, and then the pads are also made out of 1045. And if you unscrew these, this is um, one, one thing that I use the shaper for, is that I will use it on both sides of this. And if you can see this, um, these have a little bit of, um, of tooth on them, so I use my shaper with a fast advance and it creates lines that go across um, and that creates enough bite, because if you were to just make these smooth, then the saw blade slips out when you go to tighten the saw. And it took me a minute to figure out the right uh, kind of depth and cut to do, because if you make it too coarse, then it will just break off the saw blade when you tighten it. So. This is 1045, the pads are 1045, yeah. Yep. Any more questions about the saw? Okay. Where's the handle material? Uh, these are mahogany, yeah. I think it's, I've always loved mahogany. I think it's a really beautiful wood, yeah. So you turn the ferrules on the lathe also? Yep. The ferrules move the handle? I do, yep, yeah, turn those on the lathe. Turn the, turn the handles on the lathe as well, yep. Um, I don't know, we have 15 minutes left. I could, I don't know what I could do. What do you guys want me to do? File. File? <laughs> <laughs> Engrave? I can do a quick little engraving intro in like 
usually I do an hour long intro, but <laughs> we can do a 10 minute intro. Um, so I did bring my engraving chisels. Um, and ooh, hmm, I had a piece of material here that I used yesterday. I'm not going to do it on the dividers. <laughs> we could do it on the dividers. Where are the dividers? Where are the dividers? I'm not going to do it on the dividers, not in 10 minutes. <laughs> um, I'll do it on something else, like this. So. Um, the engraving tools I use, I make out of um, different materials like O1, W1, 1084. Usually it's a higher carbon steel. I don't make them out of 1045 or 4140. It's usually up there in carbon to be a good uh, cutting tool, much like a knife would be, um, because that's essentially what it is. It's a knife that's cutting through metal. Um, there's many different shapes of engraving chisels, but there's two main ones that I use. I don't know if you'll be able to see these um, if, if I hold them up here. I don't know how close we can get. Um, but these are two of the somewhat larger ones. And one is basically in, is going to make the shape of a V cut. Um, one is going to make the shape of a V cut. And one is essentially a flat chisel that has an equal bevel on either side. You can go ahead and look at these after the demo's over to get a closer look. But the V-chisel is used for line work. It's for doing just, for the most part, for doing lines that are the same width. Um, you can, by going a little bit deeper or tipping it to one side or the other, you can get a little bit of variation in that line. And then for the most part, the flat chisel is used for doing what's called the bright cuts. Or if you can imagine uh, a bit of script where a letter gets thin and thick and then thin again, it's for doing that. And it's basically like a, a calligraphy pen where you're laying it over, you're laying that calligraphy pen over, or I don't know how to do calligraphy, I don't know if that's how you do it, but as the pen, as more of the pen is touching, as more of the chisel is digging into the material, you're getting wider and then thinner as you stand it back up and come back out. Um, let me do a quick little, I need to get a filed surface on here real quickly. Speed engraving. Um, for this, I mean, we're kind of like right at the end here. I don't know how you guys feel about this free form thing I'm about to propose, but you're welcome to come on up and watch me do this because it's such a small thing. Um, you know, it might just be a little bit easier. I know it won't be good for the cameras, but. Um, You're gonna walk around, though. I am going to walk around, though. Sorry. So what angle face do you have? On the chisels? Yeah. Um, I, it's about a 45 degree angle. I don't think I'm, you know, there that's you go. <laughs> great. I need a hammer. <laughs> it's a, can someone just hand me the chasing hammer? Oh, the little one? Uh, the, the main chip, yeah, yeah. So, um, I don't have a pencil on me, but engraving is a lot about drawing. Um, no, yeah, maybe. <laughs> engraving is a lot about drawing. So, like, if I'm going to do, ooh, this is like, Too big. <laughs> the, yeah, <laughs> and it's broken. <laughs> So I'm about to do a tiny, can you see that L? I'm about to do an L. Um, and so the first thing I do is I'll use the flat chisel to do the bright cut. And I'll start in that bright cut. 
at the top of that break cut. Oops. And I'll lay that chisel down. And then I'll come back out. So that's kind of like, whoa. The bright cut is the bright part of the letter. So if you think about engraving or calligraphy that has the wide part, that's the bright cut. Um, and then I'll use this V chisel to connect. Down in front. Who? Get out of the way. Who's in the way? How rude. And I'll often use um, oil when I'm doing this. This is like a super haphazard engraving demo right now. So I usually I'm using oil. Um, sorry, this is, it's moving around the piece a lot. And um, and I'll dip this in at the end so you can kind of see, you can make that line a little bit wider too by laying the V chisel over. Um, I'm twisting the chisel. So that's more of the blade than the metal? Yes, so you know, more. On one side, less on the other side. And engraving is a much, as much about drawing as anything. See, so that one I really laid it over at the end there and made that nice big wide tail. Okay? Fastest engraving demo ever, I think. <laughs> <laughs> what if you can't draw? Then you need to learn to draw. Yeah, because <laughs> so engraving gets broken down into drawing and chisel cuts. So you draw what you need to engrave, and then you know that you have certain chisels that make certain shapes or lines, and you just, it's a series of cuts. Like when I'm cutting lettering, I don't think about, I do think about the letter I'm cutting, but it's more like, I'm cutting a T, so I need to do, in Roman lettering, so I need to do a wide straight line. That, like I engraved these Penland Outstanding Educator Awards. Has that right on it? And I engraved all the uprights first. E, or P, E, <laughs> not N, L, not A, uh, N, B. Like all the uprights of that, well of everything, and then go back and do all the horizontals, and then do all the curved bright cuts. And so it's like you break it down into this series of just brush strokes, kind of. Yeah. Can you mark it for the engraving? Uh, so for really fine work, I will put something down on, the, on what I'm engraving. It might, sometimes it's um, white watercolor pigment works well. So I just like take it right out of the thing with my thumb and kind of tap it on there. Um, you can use even. Um, 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 chapstick, uh, or if I'm in a pinch, I rub oil, nose oil onto it. Gives it a little bit of something for then a nice sharp, like drafting pencil to grab into, and so you can see the graphite um, 